back in the day, before I was even born, everybody was self-hosting their emails. It was sort of like the rite of passage as a geek. If you were into tech and computers and stuff like that, you'd host your own emails. Whereas these days, it's mainly dominated by two or three big providers. You got Microsoft with their 365 and all of the Office suite, giving it to all companies and businesses. You've got Google with Gmail making it massively public for everybody to have a free email account. And well, there are a few others. There are some privacy focused ones and some ones like that. So why has self-hosted email gone away? It comes down to how difficult it's become with SPF records, DKIM and reverse IP lookup, gray lists, black lists of IP addresses and domains, um, and all of that sort of stuff. And we're going to be getting into that. Because do you know what I'm still doing here in 2025? You guessed correct. I am still hosting my own emails. So I'm going to talk to you about the struggles and why I enjoy it. I think for you to understand how complicated it's become, we need to show what it was like back in the day. How simple it used to be before they added all of these features. And as you can see here, I've got a sender server, a receiving server, and the domain system. Those are the three things you need. You need to set up a record on your DNS, which is called an MX record, which is a mail exchange record. This essentially tells incoming and outgoing mail clients where the mail server is to send emails and stuff. And that's it. Literally, you set up your MX record, you spin up something like Postfix or Send Mail, and that was it. That was all you had to do. Your email was done. I'll demonstrate this now. So, so if you've got the client at green server wanting to send mail to the orange server, so e.g. other thomas.com wants to send emails to thomasdie.net, what it would do first of all is it would make a lookup to the DNS system and get back the MX record. So this would return back that thomasdie.net exists at 20.0.1.1, right? Okay. And now all that would happen is then the green server would talk to the orange server via something called SMTP, simple mail transfer protocol. Essentially, this is the way to send emails. This is what actually happens between the two servers. And that was it. That was all that was done. Those were the checks. That was it. But you can see here fundamentally why this is going to go wrong. I think I now need to explain why this is going to go wrong. To best demonstrate one of the main problems, which is there's no ability to verify the sender, we're going to look at this. So say you're no longer green server, but you're now red server, but you want to claim to be otherthomas.com, right? So in the old way of doing it, you do the lookup again, but then when you're sending the email across, you just set the from header to be thomas at other thomas.com and that would be it. The receiving email server would expect and believe, rightly so, that it has come from otherthomas.com. This brought about phishing problems and scamming problems because anybody could pretend to impersonate anybody else. So you don't need to be impersonating otherthomas.com, you could be impersonating something.gov and it was pretty much as simple as this. So of course you can see now why they've added all of these additional features. And well, let's talk about what they've added and why they've added it and what it does to mitigate this problem. Given a scenario that we both now understand, I've written out what they've added. So they've added five things, really. Four of them are protective measures, and the fifth one is about how to handle if you fail one of those protective measures. So let's look at the kind of simplest one to understand, which is SPF records. This is sender policy framework. Back in our example from earlier, let's add this SPF record, this sender policy framework. So we've got otherthomas.com, which is our sending email server, which of course we're sending to thomasdie.net. They would add a text record or what used to be an FPS record. It used to be its own domain type, but these days we just use text. Um, we don't have to set no priority or stuff like that. You would set this string. So this string says that they were using SPF version one and that we're using an IPv4 domain. So essentially what it's doing is the receiving um, mail server will look at this record 
to work out if the sending server has the ability to send on behalf of this domain. So we set here in the IP section, the sending IP address of the server. So if you are green server, which is at 10.0.1.1, you'll be okay. But red server won't be okay because it doesn't exist at that IP. You can also then say that it includes, I've put an asterisk here just as a demonstration, but what you would also say here is another domain. So say, so emails from your domain may also be sent from, I don't know, say microsoft.com. They might be sending your emails. You just put include whatever Microsoft's FPF record is there. And then you specify here all. So you can use like a squiggly line that has a proper name. I can't remember what it is. Or like a straight line, like a dash. That indicates how explicitly to treat this. So if you use a dash, it means it has to match one of two of these records for it to go through. And this is the first step in email security. So now how does that change the scenario? In this situation, when it gets to 20.0.1.1, it's going to do a lookup. So let's look it up. It'll look up the SPF record and get it back. And then it will look at who sent the email to the server. So the sender's incoming IP address, which in this case, in our example, is 30.0.1.1. I know that's not a public IP address, but it doesn't matter. And it will look at that and compare it to this, and which it'll say that it doesn't match. So it won't proceed to input that email and treat it as it'll reject it and put a big stop to it and probably just mark it as spam and log that against the system that that IP address is trying to impersonate otherthomas.com. So this is the first step. Of course, if it was coming from, from 10.0.1.1, it would be all good and it would save it. Now we're going to add step number two. We're going to come back to DKIM because this is a bit more complicated, but let's first look at reverse DNS. So this is kind of along the same lines as what we just did, is the receiving email system will do a lookup about the IP address. So say we validated the SPF and that was fine. We're now going to do a lookup about the IP address. So in this case, it's 30.0.1.1. So we'll go from here to there and we'll get back the PTR record. This is a reverse lookup of the IP address. So if you type in an IP address into a domain system, it'll tell you what domain name is associated with that at the provider level. So in this case, if you look up 30.0.1.1, its PTR record is baddomain.com. It'll then compare that to the SPF record for the included domains option and the sending from domain, which in this case also won't match. And that is the second check or one of the checks. I'm not necessarily saying it'll do it in this order, but that is one of the key checks that they do to make sure that the origin server is validated. The way to make sure you pass this is to make sure that your PTR record looks up to your domain or a subdomain of your domain. Sometimes subdomains can still flag it, this is not treated itself as a singular failure point, but it is part of giving it a score. These combine together to give you what is known as a validation score on the email. And with a high score, you're likely to get through, low score, you're likely to get marked as spam or a scammer. I'll now talk you through some of the other ones. They're a bit more complicated to add to the diagram, so I won't add them, but it's looking a bit cluttered. But basically, we've got IP reputation. This one's pretty self-explanatory, I think. Essentially, there are lists, blacklists, grey lists, white lists, um, and scores and stuff like that that are publicly available that your emailing system can download and look at, which rate IP addresses. So you can look up whether your IP address is on a blacklist or is not. That determines how your emails are received. If you're on a blacklist, you're most likely going to get blocked and you're not going to get any sort of response. They're not going to see your email. It might go to their spam. It might not even do that. That's what that's all about. That's quite simple. You just need to look up and you just need to be vigilant about applying to get off those lists and applying to do this and applying to do that to make sure you're not on them lists. And DKIM or Domain Key Identified Mail 
is something that just adds to your mail score. Essentially what you do is, on your server, you cryptographically hash your email to give you a signature. You put that signature in the header, and then on the receiving side, they compare that against your public key. Your public key is also added to your domain, and then they can just check that you signed that email. And that just adds an additional step of validation that the two are the same, which is good and very easy to do. So all of those combined together to really give you a score. And now what you've got to do is with domain, message, authentication, reporting and confidence, this essentially says, what do I do if you fail? If I fail this check and this check, what happens? Or if I fail all three of these, what happens? You've got options. The first one is sort of none, do nothing. It failed, just let it through, let it through. We've got an issue, we've got to just let it through, that's fine. Um, quarantine it, e.g. put it as spam or something like that. You're concerned that it might not be um, correct or reject it. You can then also set up an email address that it can send those emails to at your domain. So say otherthomas.com had got a DKIM set up that said come to thomas at otherthomas.com. If the email fails to be received, e.g. it's failed enough of these rules that it doesn't want to save it in the system, it'll send it there and then somebody from your IT department can have a look at it. I've got all this set up. And you know what? I think I should show you what my domain looks like. There's a web, great website called Mail Tester. We'll go there now. So this is Mail Tester. It allows me to send them a email and it'll test how spammy it looks. Let me do that and I'll show you. So as you can see here, I've sent my email and I've got quite a high score. I've got a 9.9 .9 out of 10. Okay, let's look at this. I'm not gonna click on the first one. I'm not gonna show you the contents of the message or who it came from, but let's look at the spam assist. So as you can see here, it's broken out each of the sections. So it's saying that the email does contain a DKIM signature. So I've put a signature on it and it's valid. Um, it has valid signature, all that sort of stuff. It's checked all of that. It's flagged at negative 1.98 that the contents of my message is likely to be spam or random stuff. All I did was put the words test in the email. I didn't go for anything massive there. So that's why I've got a negative score there. It's marked the return path as safe and it's marked the SPF as safe. You can see down here that it says I'm not fully authenticated. What's going on here? Your server is authorized to use shop at thomasdye.net. Your DKIM signature is valid. It's the reverse DNS it doesn't look up. So the IP address 213.48.240.67 is associated with the domain 67 blah, 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 blah. Nevertheless, your mail appears to be sent from mail.thomasdye.net. So it's flagging those two as being different. Though they have the same root domain, it's still flagging them as different. I'm not necessarily concerned by that because they're clearly similar and that will play a part. They just don't have, so if it was something like something.mail.thomas.net, I think you'd be okay. But overall, it's come out with a very high score. That kind of explains how setting up email has become so complicated. And I think from that, you can understand why people aren't doing it. Because a lot of these features weren't in it originally, they've been added via DNS, which has resulted in there not being any clean ways to test or set up this stuff or maintain it really. It's all a bit of a, we'll throw that on now, and we'll throw that on now, and we'll throw that on. So I think the main question you probably have is why am I still doing it? Why am I still hosting and self-hosting? Well. The main one comes down to experience and learning stuff and just trying it out a bit. Like, as I've explained there, I now have quite a deep understanding of all of these different things and getting them right. And that's been through trial and error of setting it up. I do own some other domain email addresses that aren't hosted through my system. And that's convenient because it allows me to test my own emails. It's also quite a lot of fun and it's cheaper. So I probably have about 200, 300 email addresses on my domain right now. They go to different people in the team. That has no additional cost to me than the cost of the server that they're running on. Whereas if it was something like Microsoft or Google Workspace, whatever that's now called, they normally charge you per user and per head with storage limits of about 10 gig or something like that. Whatever it is, I don't know. But I ain't got any of those problems, nor have I got any storage limits. 
Of course, there is physical storage limits, but I'm not enforcing those on a per mail client. But yeah, I just thought I'd explain to you how difficult it is. And well, if you've enjoyed this video and you've got this far, please hit the subscribe button and the like button. Comment down who you're using and whether you'd want to use your own. I can always do a physical tour of how I'm doing this, how I've got it set up, what I've actually got set up, all of that sort of stuff, if any of you are interested in that. And otherwise, I'll see you in the next one. Thank you for watching.